thanks uh, to my elder Ross for being here and uh, opening up the floor in such a good way for us and planting those seeds of things to think about uh, and that important documentation of the United, De United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. And I really encourage you all to go back home uh, and make sure that that's something that you are all, if you're not already, if you are familiar with that. Uh, so my name is Rihanna Bennett and I'm from Musqueam and it gives me really good feelings to see you all here today to come out um, for those of us that are candidates to take pause from our busy uh, campaigning to come here to have such an important conversation and for the other candidates that are out in the audience I you know, raise my hands for you for recognizing that this is a good use of your time on the campaign trail so I really appreciate each of you being here. So like five minutes to talk about like... <laughs> <laughs> Where to start? <laughs> so, uh, in my interview, I talked about um, my my work within the provincial system. So I'm going to sort of leave that aside because uh, we really wanted to be speaking today about some more of the, the local issues. Uh, so in 2014, I decided uh, to run for the school board, and that was something that I had explored. Uh, where did I want to put my efforts? Do I want to run for the school board? Do I want to run provincially? Do I want to run federally? Federally? Uh, and talked to a lot of people, talked to a lot of seasoned uh, politicians, talked to my good friend Sue Hamill, uh, and the advice that I always got was run where you're gonna win. Uh, so then I had to sort of stop and think about that. It's like, well, where, where, am I, where is it that I'm most likely to win? Uh, and I decided that um, school board was the best fit for me uh, because it, um, well, a lot of the issues I have with the school system, I figured that was a good place to start too. Uh, and that was a seat that was um, more attainable for my experience and for my first campaign. So, uh, like everyone else here, I sort of you know moved to moved to action uh, because of the work that I was doing on the front lines was always impeded by some poor policy and always impeded by underfunding. So it was it was you know 20 years of uh, of that to which I was like, okay, well now it's time for me. Uh, I've got the experience, I've got the knowledge, uh, I've felt the pain, I've seen the pain, uh, I've got ideas, I've got solutions, now is the time for me to get to the table to start to address some of those issues. I remember running my out-of-school care program in the early 2000s and having to hand out a notice saying that the provincial government has slashed and cut all of your subsidy and next month your, your child care rates are going to double. Uh, and I was having that to single working moms, and it was uh, not something that I enjoyed doing. And at that moment, uh, and the look on those parents' faces was something that really motivated me to, to start looking at things a little bit differently. So as far as, uh, as racism, I don't, I don't have a, a particularly a lot to share specifically about racism. Um, mostly because the racism that I come up with is uh, what I call Canadian racism. Uh, it is embedded into Canadian culture to be inherently racist and discriminatory towards Indigenous people. Uh, and if you watched any of the first contact, you'll see that that was a snapshot of six average Canadians and the kind of um, how effective uh, dehumanizing Indigenous people and devaluing us has been uh, throughout Canada and how a lot of newcomers moving here today are uh, really oblivious to that because Canada's got this world reputation of being the safe place, of being the place to escape to, of being this. Um, but I guarantee you that everything that brought my colleagues here's families to these lands is the same thing that was done to my families here. So it's the same, it's the same thing. And that's why there's such strength between our communities is because of that, that colonialism, imperialism, and patriarchy that hurts, uh, that has driven people from their lands to seek refuge here. So the, the system is inherently racist towards me. And you know, part of my motivation for running for the school board was that education was used as a tool of, of was used as a weapon of genocide. Uh, and now that system of education now has a responsibility to heal, to educate, and to uplift and provide opportunities for indigenous people. Uh, but first it needs to stop doing the harm. And there's still a lot of harm being done within the education system. So adding my voice to the table and to be reminding people and senior leadership of that harm and of that, that bias was so critically important. So now here I am running for my, uh, my second term and I've uh, come across uh, some difficulties. So uh, a number of my 
months ago when people were still sort of figuring out who was going to run, who was going to run together. I had a meeting with um, four other potential candidates. Uh, my running mate to the back, Andrea, as well as three uh, middle-aged uh, uh, middle-aged white men. Uh, five, so, and we're all, all progressive, all NDP supporters, all going to be after the union support, all going to be after the same, the same support, the same votes. And that's five for a board of seven. Uh, and four of those voices, uh, four of those people, were going to be uh, excluded from bargaining because they're also all uh, union memberships, uh, GTA, sorry, um, uh, members of BCTF and members of QP. So if we were all to get elected, then our board wouldn't function because we wouldn't have a quorum. We would have to go to court um, to get a court order to, to function uh, without a quorum. So right away, I'm like, well, that's a problem. I'm like, the five of us cannot all run together. Uh, the, it doesn't make sense for us to be having a, a big takeover of the majority of the board. It doesn't make sense for four people to be running who are excluded. It doesn't make sense for two women to be running with three men. And so at the end of that meeting, I said to the, to the men there um, that five was too many, and the likelihood of me asking one of the women not to run was zero. So they needed to figure it out. And the response I got back from each of them was, well, I'm gonna run anyhow. So, so to me, that is, a, that is a huge issue when we're talking about racial justice and, and local democracy. There's only seven seats on the school board. And now we've got three other progressive people who claim to be allies to indigenous issues that are, are gonna potentially, that could potentially split the vote. And to throw some salt in the, in the wound, um, one of these other candidates uh, sought out an endorsement from another Indigenous woman uh, from another QP local and has been paying to have that pushed through his newsfeed as him touting his, uh, his skills and his abilities uh, as an Indigenous ally. And I will tell you that that hurt so much to see that someone stands there and says that they are an ally and they're effectively, protect, they have the potential to knock me out of my seat. The first indigenous woman, they are running against me. And that is racial unjust. And that's what so many of our allies really need to understand, particularly, I'm speaking specifically to the white male allies. Uh, women, we still have a lot of way to go to achieve any sort of parity or any sort of uh, equity or equality with men, so specifically uh, to our white male allies, um, the fact that this person didn't see anything wrong with continuing down that path of uh, running against me and didn't see anything wrong with getting an endorsement from another Indigenous woman and paying to sponsor that, um, it just blows me away. I'm like, I don't, I really question um, how they define being an ally and really question um, their motivation behind that. So that's kind. Of, that's the kind of racial injustice that I'm that I'm dealing with, um, is people who are professing to be allies, um, who are effectively competing against me. So they're taking, and we know, we all know in this room. I'm I'm fairly confident uh, that the general, <laughs> the general public will still default to the middle-aged white man on the ballot. That's just the nature of the the culture that we live in. Um, that there's still this, this toxic patriarchy where the default still relies on that middle-aged white man voice. Uh, so now this loud middle-aged white man voice is telling very loudly that they're an ally and they're speaking over me. Uh, and that really, uh, it's been a really tough few days that I've been processing that. How am I doing for time? We've got it up. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> So that's just a, a, a little snapshot. Um, you know, there, there isn't that overt um, racism that I've had to, to become up against, but it's the quiet whispers, it's the, um, I was featured in an article about racism in my local paper, uh, made some comments about something, and then suddenly I've been booted from a secret community Facebook group. So there's, there's still this, this undercurrent of racism in my community. So even coming here today, and all of the advertisement that I've seen about this event and all of my own promotion of this event has been terrifying. When I run in a conservative community where it, there are people saying the most racist things and 
I'm a candidate and I'm coming out to talk about racial justice terrifies me. Um, I, when I hit my first post to, to share this event and when I hit the post to, to pay, pay the money to boost it, I was, my stomach was turning, I was sweating, and I'm like, I'm out there. You can put my neck out on the line, uh, and, it's, and it's terrifying. So that's the kind of, um, of racial justice that we need, is we need more of those allies actually standing behind me, uh, standing next to me, uh, and some of them need to sit down and let me have my voice. Thank you.